Well, thank you very much for the invitation, and thanks everybody for coming to listen to me speak. So I want to start off just with a bit of intro to sort of set up the problem I'm considering and why it's something we might want to consider. So first, let's, so let's let x be a smooth projective variety over f, which throughout the talk will be a number field. Okay, then associated to this, we can take cohomology. And I'm always going to take a tau cohomology. I'll admit it from the notation with QP coefficients, so some hi. And maybe I'll throw in a Tate twist. So what is this? This is a finite dimensional vector space that has a continuous linear action of GF, which will be my notation throughout the talk for gal f bar over f, or f bar sum algebraic closure. Okay, And this satisfies some nice properties. So first, it's geometric. And this is geometric in the sense of fontaine maser So this is defined as saying, first, it's unramified outside finitely many places. And secondly, it satisfies a property it is the ROM. And if you're not familiar with this, that's fine. Let me just say, by way of motivation, that this is a purely Galois theoretic property. And a conjecture of Fontaine and Maser says that anytime you have an absolutely irreducible geometric, in this sense, Galois representation, it comes as a subquotient of something like this. So this is supposed to be some Galois theoretic condition that completely captures this situation. Okay, now, and let me just say, this is a theorem uh, due to faultings in Suji. Then another property that satisfies, which is the theorem of Deligne, is this is pure of weight i minus 2j. Let's recall what that means is that if unramified at v, the Frobenius acts, uh, or yeah, acts with eigenvalues. alpha that are algebraic, and moreover, their absolute value squared is equal to the norm of v to the i minus 2j for any embedding of q bar in c. Okay, so this is the notion of purity for this representation. OK, and one other property that, well, we don't know it satisfies, but we hope, is it's conjecturally semi-simple. This is a conjecture of growth in Deakins there. OK? All right, so these are some of the, so these are the nice properties this satisfies. But they really do depend, especially this conjecturally semi-simple, depend on the fact that we're taking projective and smooth here. So by way of, let's consider an, an example when that doesn't hold. So here's a non-example. Let's let E over Q be an elliptic curve. And let's take a point, a rational point of infinite order. OK? So we're going to consider the open curve. Let's let U be E minus this point and infinity. So then the inclusion of u inside of e gives us an exact sequence in cohomology. So we go to the h1 of e, base change to q bar, coefficients in qp, maps to 
h1 of u, coefficients in q bar, or base change to q bar, coefficients in qp, to the h0 of this pair of points, p infinity, qp, with the tate twist of negative 1, dot, dot, dot. So this is what comes out of the Jizen exact sequence. So I'm going to just tate twist here and here to get rid of this. And now this is a trivial representation because these are rational. And this is via the Ve pairing isomorphic to the Galois representation on the tape module. And so inside of here, I want to take the one-dimensional trivial representation generated by the divisor p minus infinity. Okay? Because under this map that goes onto the dot dot dot, this goes to zero. So I can pull this back and get a sub-representation, I call it w, that surjects onto this one-dimensional trivial piece and admits the tape module representation as a sub-representation. So this is trivial. And so in particular, pure of weight 0. This is pure of weight minus 1. And this is geometric in the sense of Fonte Maser. And it's non-split. OK? So when you work with open varieties, you can create these non-trivial extensions that do satisfy the geometric property. And their graded pieces, notice in this particular example, are of different weights. This is weight negative 1, and then the quotient has weight 0. So the philosophy is that this is part of a general picture. So let me write it this way. If, say we have an exact sequence, so we're going to v to w to the trivial representation is a non-split exact sequence with, and then since I'm just stating a philosophy, I'm going to be vague, w with w coming from geometry. And v pure, then we should expect the weight of v to be negative. Okay. So for instance, in this particular example, we we're exactly able to construct some non-split extension because this was weight negative 1. And we expect that that should always be the case. So phrase the other way, if the weight of v were non-negative, so bigger than or equal to 0, then any such representation coming from geometry should split. Okay, this is the idea. OK, so I want to make that philosophy a little bit more precise. Uh, but in terms of Galois theory, so, so to do that, we'll first do a little bit more setup, or I can state the conjecture that I'm interested in. So let's fix, say, k over qp finite. So this will be my coefficient field for all the representations that I will consider. And let's fix s, a finite set of places of f, such that I'll always assume that s contains all the places dividing p and infinity okay, for this talk. Then I'm going to let GFS, this will be an annotation for the maximal unramified outside S Galois group. So the Galois group of the maximal extension, unramified outside S. And then for any place V of F, GV will be the absolute Galois group of the completion at V. Okay, so this will be 
in my notation. First, let me let V now be a GFS rep. And throughout the talk, when I say this uh, representation of this group, I'll always mean with this coefficient field. So it'll be a finite dimensional K vector space with a continuous and K linear, linear Gal action. So then I want to consider exact sequences like this. And so this is parameterized by a Galois cohomology group. Right? This is by an H1 with coefficients in this V. So if we form the group cohomology, H1 GFS V, this is isomorphic to extensions of GFS reps that admit V is a sub-representation, and the trivial representation as a quotient. Okay? So this is a starting point for considering sort of this philosophy in a Galois theoretic way. But I want to understand the sort of the sub-things sub that look like they should come from geometry. And so for that, there's what we call the geometric block cato selmer group. is defined, we use the notation of subscript G on this cohomology, and it's the kernel of the restriction map from our first Galois cohomology group, so restriction, to the product at all places dividing P of the local Galois cohomology group, but not with co not just with coefficients in V. We tensor with Fontaine's ring of Durham periods, V Durham. Okay, so this is the definition. And now if you're not familiar with this, that's not so important. Let me just tell you what this means in terms of this picture. So So if this H1 GFSV this is equal to all extensions then the H1 geometric as you can probably guess by the name Oh, sorry, I forgot to put an assumption here. Sorry. Forgot if V is the ROM, which is the cases we'll consider in this talk, or equivalently geometric in the sense of Ponte Mazur above, then this subgroup of the set of all extensions is exactly the set of ones that are consisting of the geometric extensions. So this is exactly the condition that says, among all, th all GFS reps that admit V as a sub and the trivial as a quotient, this is the one that satisfied the Durand property in the definition of geometric, in the sense of fontaine maser So for example, in the example above, or the so-called non-example, as I called it, above the extension w in this exact sequence with the elliptic curve, it 
lies in this H1G. So just the things that look like they should come from geometry, but in a purely Galois theoretic way. So then the philosophy that I had up on the board, then in this Galois theoretic language, is the following conjecture, just due to Bach and Cato, is that if V is the ROM, and pure of weights of weight being equal to zero, then their block geometric Selmer group should be trivial. So this is exactly the Galois theoretic condition specifying that if you take, this is saying that if you take such an extension, of GSF reps, and you demand that W be the ROM, so it satisfies this geometric, if this weight is non-negative, this should just be a direct sum. Yes? Is such a W necessarily unramified or unramified? Well, sorry, I didn't. I mean, I'm taking this condition with, yeah, so I'm imposing that. Yeah, so actually, this is a good thing I should have pointed out. So I'm going to conflate for the rest of the talk this Durham and geometric because I'm always going to be considering this fixed quotient to the absolute Galois group where I'm already forcing the finite ramification. OK? OK, so this is their conjecture. Let me say this is actually part of a much more uh, general conjecture where if the weights become negative, they relate that this group is related to K theory and Chow groups and things like that. But a particular instance of that, if you look at their conjecture, is that if the weight is non-negative, then this should be equal to some K groups with negative index indices, which are all trivial. So. OK. So, but even as I stated it now, I think, I mean, in this generality, we're nowhere close to proving it that way, but I want to talk about a particular type of representation that has weight zero that has been amenable to attack in this problem, which are the so-called adjoint representations. Okay, so let me state some results towards this problem. So, so let me set up some more notation in order to say this. So I'm going to let rho denote the map given the action. On this vector space. And we'll assume it's absolutely irreducible. The ROM and pure. Let me just say, Fontaine Maser says that this should follow from this, but we don't know that. So let me add it as an assumption for now. But I'm not going to make any restriction on the weights of this purity because I'm not going to consider this representation V actually in this question. I'm going to consider a different one that I'll introduce in a second. But because I'll need it later, let me let rho bar from GFS to GLD of F. be the residual representation where F is the residue field of K. Okay, so here I want to fix some lattice, some integral lattice, take the reduction mod P, and I'll always assume it's semi-simple. This is semi-simple. I'll take that one. Though it'll be absolutely reducible soon. OK, so now the representation I want to look at in terms of this problem, so it's denoted by adro, it's a so-called adjoint representation. So this is, just as a vector space, it's a set of all k homomorphisms from V to V, 
with the adjoint GFS action. Okay, so if we, you know, under this fixed basis, if we identify this just with n by n matrices, we're just taking conjugates, conjugation by the elements under row. So IE sigma acts on an element x, a row sigma x, a row sigma inverse. Now the point here is that this representation, this is geometric because, well, first off, I mean, again, it's finitely ramified because I've just restricted to myself to that situation. It's also Durham because of just nice properties. We know this Durham, this property being Durham, but it's also pure of weight zero. Okay? Because if you think about the Frobenius eigenvalues acting on this, they act as alpha, beta inverse, where alpha and beta are two Frobenius eigen eigenvalues for V, right? And since they have some fixed weight, their ratio will have weight zero. Okay, so in, in this situation then, conjecture of Bloch and Cato then predicts Cato, we should have H1 geometric of this ad row trivial. So there are no geometric extensions of this representation, by the, or by the, of the trivial representation by this one. Okay. So let me just state what was previously known about this problem, roughly. I'll give a sort of overview of some of the history. So the results generally always involve automorphic techniques at some point on this. So in particular, if d equals 2, f equals q, and rho is rho f with f modular form of weight k big and equal to 2. So these were the first cases really considered in this problem. And the first example, so actually, let me also say plus extra. So every result I'm going to sort of briefly mention has a slew of technical conditions sometimes attached to them. And rather than make them precise, I'd rather say what's not a, an assumption in certain ones to sort of, how do you say? I mean, it's, it's going to just make things a little bit easier. So one of the first cases of this was proved by Flock. This is in 92. And in this situation, he proved this in the case where f was associated to an elliptic curve. Right, so this is a modular form that has rational Hecke coefficients, weight 2 kind of thing, uh, under some technical conditions, as I said. And then the next sort of uh, result of this form follows from the work of Taylor, Wiles, and Wiles in their modularity lifting theorems. And let me say that this, though, I mean, really, the main thing is this is actually a corollary of their r equals t theorems. And it doesn't, it doesn't just assume, it doesn't assume that rho is modular, but really only assumes that rho bar is modular, that the residual representation. So you don't have to actually, and this follows, let me just say, and I'll come back to this. from the so-called R equals T theorems. OK? And again, I'm going to sort of talk about this more. But let me just say briefly, what's the point here? Why do you get this as a corollary of this sort of theorem? Well, this can be interpreted as a tangent space in this ring R at a characteristic 0 point. Okay? But if you're equating this to a Hecke algebra, we know that we invert p. This is semi-simple. It's just some product of fields corresponding to coefficient fields. So there's no tangent space on this side of the equation when you invert p. So this is how this result follows. There's a corollary of this. Okay. 
So again, I'll, I'll come back to talking about this a little bit more. And then, oh, sorry, this is let me use the date, 95, to give some of the timeline. Diamond, Flack, and Guo, published in 04. Basically, this is similar to this above, uh, but more if the weight is bigger than or equal to 3. That's all I'll say. I mean, there are some restrictions, as I said, in this theorem. But then, Kissin, also published in 04. And the, really, the merit of this work, or what's really great about this, is this is the only one where there's no restriction on the level of f. So this is, as I said, I want to point out what's not assumed in some cases. And this was really the big improvement, is that in everything before, there's some restriction on the level. In particular, I think in this result, this result, and this one, in the non-ordinary case, you have to assume p doesn't divide the level of the modular form. But you can, you can let p divide the level in ordinary here. But this really puts no restriction on it. OK, and then lastly, I just want to mention uh, result of Weston, which has some pretty restrictive things on the level, but it's the only one with no assumption on the image of the residual representation. So this is one of the technical conditions that arises in this, is you need to assume the residual representation is often big enough. But Weston was able to get away with no case here, but he has some, some things on the level. In particular, it has to be co-prime with P. So, so this is, this is the lay of the land in this situation. So what happens, let's say we want d bigger than 2, or f not equal to q. And let me just say it's much less. So, so there's no theorem where there's no extra assumption? No. No, definitely not. Yeah, no, there is no. There is no, yeah, exactly. There is no theorem just of this form. Yeah, no, there's always some sort of condition. But let me say that although Kissin does have a res, uh, an assumption on the image of Robar, it's milder than some of the previous. So in my, in my opinion, this is the best we have. OK, so let me say much less is known. And again, it's to the point where there are even more technical hypotheses. So let me just say some, let me just mention some names but, and then say out loud some of what was done. So some results of Dimitrov, and also you can get some results from Kissin when the dimension is 2 and f is totally real. Oh, Kissin. OK. Let me just say, for instance, uh, in this, when I say some results of Kissin, this would be under the assumption, for those familiar with this, of it being potentially Bersotti Tate. You need that assumption implied. So nothing for you know, general weights. Uh, and let me just say sort of a more restrictive theorem. Results when the dimension is uh, bigger than 2 by work of Clozell Harris Taylor. But this more restrictive result, I won't say exactly what it is, but we need to put more conditions than just this geometric. You need to put some extra conditions on this, so you would really be considering a potentially proper subspace of this. Of course, they both should be 0, so it shouldn't be proper, but a priori. We don't know this. And let me say what the problem is in this. So what gives? I said that these results, first of Taylor Wiles Wiles and Diamond Flack Guo, these use R equals T technology. And these modularity lifting theorems have really been pushed really far in recent years. And there are some really general ones that hold in higher dimensions. So why don't we get? This vanishing of the H1 geometric, and the problem is exactly is that most of these new modularity lifting theorems prove 
in our reduced equals t theorem. And this is not enough for applications to H1G. This is the issue, right? Because as I mentioned before, or alluded to above, this H1G is a tangent space of this ring in the generic fiber. But if you've reduced it, you've lost all information of tangent space. That's gone. So you can't deduce anything about the H1 geometric. This is the problem. OK. But the point I want to make is that even though this doesn't fall out of the theorems, you can actually use the method to prove a pretty general theorem of this form. That if you just put a minor twist on the argument partway through, you get this result in a fair amount of generality. So in order to let me introduce a little bit more notation before I state the theorem. So now I'm going to assume f is a CM field. And f plus its maximal totally real subfield. Let's uh, let c and gf plus be a choice of complex conjugation. And so I want to assume now that. Pardon? This is all any d. Any d bigger than equal to 2. Exactly. Yeah. OK. So assume that I should say in general that in the d equals 1 case is cost field theory, once you know a little bit of the local things. Uh, OK. So yeah. Assume v conjugate is isomorphic to v dual tensor chi with chi a character of the maximal totally real subfield. Okay, And in my to notation, I'm going to confuse places of f plus and places of f. Imagine I just chose the s from the begin with as uh, elements in the totally real subfield. Or you can think of it as being all the places below the set s I fixed before. OK. Then under this condition, this polarizability condition, the GFS action on add rho extends to a GF plus S, S action. Okay. So this is keeping track of the fact that this has this conjugate self-duality up the twist. So then you can state the theorem, and maybe I'll state on a new board. So first, assume p is odd. Technical thing. Now here's the. Let's assume. Well, I've I've said that this was the ROM before, so it will be an algebraic character. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so let's assume. Let's see. There is a finite extension L over F of CM fields and regular algebraic polarizable let's see regular algebraic make sure I get all the yeah cuspidal automorphic representation of GLD AL such that first I want the restriction of my Galois representation to this open subgroup GL to be isomorphic to the representation given by this automorphic form with respect to some isomorphism of the coefficient fields. Okay, so I need this potential automorphic assumption. And then the technical condition which is 
I want to assume that a pth root of unity does not belong to L, and that the image, when I restrict to the open subgroup corresponding to adding a pth root of unity to L, this is adequate. So let me not define this, but I'll just state how you can think about it, is that it's equivalent to absolutely irreducible if p is large enough, where large enough means strictly bigger than twice the dimension plus 1. And this is by a theorem of Goralnik, Herzig, Taylor, and Thorne. So you can think of this as being, so for large primes, it's literally equivalent to being absolutely irreducible. For small primes, it's a bit of a strengthening and some technical thing. But this really is the natural higher dimensional analog of the assumptions on the residual representation that appeared in the work of Taylor, Wiles, and Wiles, and also Diamond Flack, Guo, that I mentioned before. So under these assumptions, we get the result that the H1 geometric is 0. Then H1 geometric GFS add rho. Oh, sorry, GF plus S. Sorry, this is important. This is trivial. So this is the main theorem. OK. OK, so let me make some remarks about this before I'll, then I'll do some, some of the sketch of proof. So firstly, uh, there's a similar theorem. for totally real fields, suitably phrased. Uh, so secondly, though, I want to just point out there's no assumption on the level. So this gives new results, even in dimension 2 when f is totally real. I mean, there's nothing new when f is q in this case. OK? So but thirdly, let me also say, some similar work was uh, independent. So a similar result was obtained independently by Broy, Hellman, make sure. Yeah. And Shrain. Uh, assuming further that I run it up. So assuming further that pi v is unramified at all v dividing p. So with an assumption on the level, adding that the level be full places dividing p, but, yeah, but also working in all dimension, but with the restriction on the level. And let me just say, they also, I mean, the way it's written, they assume l equals f, i.e. the not potential. But let me just lead to the next remark. The potential part is easy. Since restriction is injective on H1 by restriction co-restriction. Because our we're in characteristic 0. So restriction, co-restriction tells you restriction is always injected. So if you want to prove this h1 f plus geometric is trivial, it suffices to inject it into the h1 for l plus and show that that's 0. Right? That's OK. But, but this is useful. Right? The fact that knowing that 
it suffices to allow potential modularity is great because we have a lot of really good potential automorphic theorems nowadays. So you can apply this in particular cases. Right? So for instance, the following example was, I have to thank David Hansen for pointing this out to me. It's sort of a nice illustration. Is let's say let's let f be a modular form, modular new form of weight k big and equal to 2. Let's let n be odd and assume p satisfies. So we want to assume p is sufficiently large, where by sufficiently large, let me say, bigger than 2n plus 4. And secondly, assume that the residual representation of f, the image of this, contains SL2 of fp. So this certainly this holds if f is not cm and p is sufficiently large. Then we can deduce, deduce the vanishing of the h1 geometric for gqs of the following weight 0 representation. Take the sim 2n of rho f and then twist it by the determinant of rho f to the negative n. Okay. This is a weight 0, a pure weight 0 representation. And the point is, is that if you look at just the sim n without this determinant part, that's potentially automorphic by work of uh, Barnett, Lamb, Garrity, Harris, and Taylor. And then the sim 2n with this twist embeds as a direct summand in this thing. So you get the vanishing for free. Okay. Okay, so. And in the remaining time, let me talk about the proof. OK, so remember, so I'm going to write this on a little bit of strange board work. So what do we want? We want write this over here, h1 geometric. So as I said, as, let me just say first thing. As I mentioned above, you can assume f equals l in the statement. That's right. So we want to show this vanishing of the h1 geometric of g f plus s add rho. Or now we know rho is given by an automorphic form. Okay, so yeah, uh, because otherwise it doesn't embed into one of these conjugate self-dual things. So what you can get is if n is even, if you twist this by the quadratic character associated to some auxiliary imaginary field, then you can get that. But the problem is, is that so because if you take because when n is odd, the sim n then is symplectic. And so then it embeds, this, then this thing embeds into the Lie algebra of a symplectic thing. Uh -huh. And the theorem for totally real fields that I just said exists says that if you're symplectic, you can induce vanishing for the symplectic Lie algebra. If you're orthogonal, you can deduce vanishing for the orthogonal Lie algebra. So when n is even, this thing is still symplectic, but it doesn't embed into the orthogonal Lie algebra. So that's why I can't do it. I mean, essentially, what's happening then is this is again, this comes back to the fact that this is only working for f plus and not f. Because what I'm controlling is the deformation theory that deforms with the fixed polarization, but not the deformation theory that could deform in some opposite polarization. OK. All right, so as I said before, we want this. And actually, this leads into exactly my next thing. So what do we do? Well, the deformation theory of Clozell, Harrison, Taylor. What does this give us? It gives a deformation ring, R, and a K-algebra homomorphism from its generic fiber, 
such that the tangent space at x is equal to the thing we want to prove is 0, this h1 geometric add row. OK? So we get this. So what does that mean? It now suffices to prove that if we take the localization and completion of this ring, that this is just k. That has no tangent space. This is the reduction, the first reduction step. All right, so what else do we have, though, from this theory? Well, this is automorphic. So we get, we also have, there is an R module, M, such that the localization and completion of R at this point acts on the localization and completion of M on this point via the surjection to the residue field. Okay, so what is this? This is some space of automorphic forms. And what does it mean to localize and complete this module at that point? I'm just saying we're picking out the automorphic forms such that R is acting via this fixed Heike Eigen system. Right? So the deformation ring is just acting on each old form by that fixed Heke Eigen system. So it's just acting via this quotient. So in particular, the next reduction step is then Rx completed acts on Mx completed faithfully. And that will prove what we want. Okay. There's no kernel in this action. All right. So now what do we do? So the Taylor Wells and then with also ingredients of Kissin patching method. What does it give us? It gives us this diagram that I'll say a little bit more of later. Some ring, R loc, we take a power series over it. It surjects onto some other ring, R infinity, which acts on some module, M infinity. But the point is these two things surject onto R and M respectively, and such that here and here, this is modding out by the same equations. OK? All right. So here is one way you might try to prove this, that Rx completed acts faithfully on Mx completed. And this is, I mean, in some sense, a modern interpretation of what happened in some of these older cases is that if R acted faithfully on M, that would certainly imply it, and we'd be in great business. And what would suffice for R acting faithfully on M? Well, because we're modding out by the same equations in this descent, it would suffice if you could prove R infinity, or sorry, M infinity. I'm going to leave a bit of room because I'm going to come back to this, because what I'm writing right now won't be true in our case, is a free. R infinity module. Right. If you could prove that, we would be in business. Okay. Well, how might you hope to show that? Well, let me just say that something, some more of the data that I didn't specify here in this diagram, plus some theorems of Serre and Auslander Buxbaum. actually tell us that in order to prove this, it suffices to know that this ring that I haven't told you anything about yet is regular. Okay. This is what comes out of the method. OK, Okay, but what is this ring? Well, this is a completed tensor product over V and S of some RV with Rv are certain local deformation rings, where in our case, 
it's the universal lifting ring if V doesn't divide P, and one of Kissin's potentially semi-stable lifting rings. if V does divide P, okay? And now we're in trouble, right? I've led you astray. So the problem is, is that, you know, in previous, in the work of, for instance, uh, Wiles, Taylor Wiles, and also Diamond, Flack, and Guo, this really was regular, and we could do this. But in this case, it's not. I mean, this could have multiple components, for instance. It's not even a domain. And even the way I've set this up, this could have multiple components. But remember, all we wanted to show, though, was this localization and completion acted faithfully. And let me just say that the failure of this being regular is exactly why we don't have R equals T theorems anymore, but we have R reduced equals T. But for the problem we have at hand, we're not trying to prove R equals T. We're just trying to prove this. So what you do is localize and complete this whole diagram at X. So take the point, pull it back, localize and complete here. And so in fact, it suffices to prove that this, localized and completed, is free over this ring, localized and completed. And that proves what we want here, because it's still modding out by the same equations. That this is free, and in order to prove this by the exact same theorems of Sarah and Auslander Buxbaum, it suffices to prove that this, localized and completed, is regular. And now we're in much better shape, because the way these rings are constructed, we can understand their generic fiber much better than we can understand their integral models. This is something we actually have a hope. I'm sort of proving. And so what are we reduced to now? This is now, so this implies this. The next reduction step is we want to show that, bit of a line, that for all V and S, the dimension of the tangent space, at what I'll denote by XV, minus the dimension of this ring RV, its generic fiber, is equal to zero, where xv is the point on the local deformation ring corresponding to rho v, which will be my notation for the restriction of rho to the decomposition group at v. If we can do this, i.e. show that it's regular at all these local points, we can deduce this is regular and win. OK, so to now to prove this, in the case where v doesn't divide p, you can find this argument in work of Barnett, Lamb, G, Garrity, and Taylor. And what was sort of made me very happy is that it actually the exact same argument works when v divides p. And it really is the same thing, the same phenomena happening. So let me say what you get. So the point here is that we actually know the dimension of the generic fiber of these rings. In the case where V doesn't divide P by work of G, and then the tangent space, you can just understand via Euler Poincare characteristic and local Tate duality. So this is if V doesn't divide P. And in the case where V does divide P, you use work of Kissin and some local formula of Bloch and Cotto which is exactly an analog of the Euler-Poincaré characteristic and local Tate duality if he does divide P. And that tells us that the dimension of this tangent space at xv minus the dimension of this ring is equal to, well, in the case of V not dividing P, we take the adjoint representation, twist it by 1, and look at its Galois invariance. And in the case when V does divide P, this is decrease of the adjoint representation twisted by 1 with phi fixed vectors if V does divide P. This is what we get in this case. Okay, So this just comes out of some formula. Dose. Dose, yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, this is dimension. Sorry, let me put the dimension outside. It's more convenient. Dimension here. Thanks. Okay. But then what I want to convince you of is that these are the same condition. Because what's happening is this can be as the set of homomorphisms from rho v to rho v twist that are Galois equivariant. 
OK? Right? So you just pull apart this as v tensor v dual. Here, it's better not to think about this as d crisp, but to think of this as d potentially semi-stable, where we're taking the Galois invariance and the monodromy invariance and the phi invariance, and thinking of it then as a homomorphism. And so it turns out that both of these things are equivalent to asking that as Vedelin representations, the Vedelin represent the set of homomorphisms from Vedelin representations of it to its tape twists are trivial for all v in S. It's the same condition that tells you smoothness on the generic fibers of these deformation rings. And you can phrase it in terms of the Vedelin representations. And so this implies what we want. OK? And now, now that we know this, we're in good shape. Because now, by a theorem Cariani, which tells us local global compatibility. And this statement, then, is implied by asking that the Hom space of Vedelin representations of the Vedelin representation associated to the local factor, pi v, and the one associated to its Tate twist are trivial. Okay, And let me say it's really important for this statement that we know monodromy. It's exactly monodromy that's telling us that we can't find morphisms to the Tate twist. OK, but this, I mean, if you look, for instance, in Barnett, Lamb, G. Garrity, Taylor, they show you how this just, you can find this from unpacking the local Langlands correspondence. This is exactly the condition that pi v is generic. It's actually equivalent. It's equivalent to asking that pi v has a Whitaker model. But we know it has a Whitaker model for all finite places because pi is cuspidal. that finishes the proof. OK, and so I think then I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>